at exactly 5.45 a.m. on June 16, 2025. As a 40-year-old Ukrainian MiG-29 Fulcrum preparing for a cross-border airstrike operation, its RD-33 turbofans roared with titanium blue flames, and the pilot's single word in his headset silenced all the mechanics. Take off. At the same moment, the red light behind the joystick flashed, and two French AASM hammer bombs bolted to the wing pylons switched to armed status. The jet tore off the patchwork runway in Mykolaiv with fury, diving into the lowest layer of Ukrainian airspace. As the mission timer began counting down, from 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Within seconds, this 40-year-old jet would lock onto the American GPS constellation and translate French guidance into Soviet rusty cables, firing an unyielding ultimatum behind Russia's Belgorod border, thanks to zip-tie-fastened adapters. The target was a Russian command center packed with GLONASS uplink antennas in the village of Kozinka, in the Belgorod region, exactly 48 kilometers away. The concrete shell of the building was a nerve center pumping artillery fire commands, drone swarm coordinates, and electronic warfare commands simultaneously. Before this war began, no one had touched the FSB, the GRU, or the rear command centers. The mission profile was insane, even by Ukrainian standards. A 30-meter radar evading crawl, followed by a 5,000-meter nail climbing climb, a hammer salvo, and a millisecond dive. If there was a single deviation, every radar screen from Moscow to Vladivostok would be flooded with red sirens. If this facility were completely neutralized, Russian artillery batteries would be blind, drone swarms would be mute, and electronic warfare stations would be deaf. The designers of the MiG had not taught GPS to its avionics 40 years ago. USB CAN converters from tiny workshops in Kiev had been smuggled into the cockpit panels to translate the French weapon computer's MGRS coordinates into the Soviet RSBN-5 system. The cables were secured to the wing panels with zip ties, and an iPad mini served as the witness to this unlikely union. The first challenge of the mission was to prevent this Frankenstein avionics setup from exploding before it could be neutralized. The second was to use the hammer's 70-kilometer glide range to get the bombs across the border. But the MiG had to remain within Ukrainian airspace because if the jet crossed the horizon, the S-400 batteries would draw their 400-kilometer swords and slice the entire plane out of the sky. As the jet dove below the treetops, the radar horizon lost its meaning, and the jet wash turned the wheat below into a vacuum field, hastily carving fissures in the soil. The border was 48 kilometers away. In six minutes, the hammer missiles would break away from the air, but the MiG would still be within its own territory. When the RWR panel detected the first beep from the east, the pilot locked the throttle at 92% and sliced through the curves of the wet riverbed at 840 kilometers per hour. The target was a command center located directly in the middle of the old cooperative warehouse, reinforced with double-walled concrete. Thick steel chimneys resembling GLONASS uplink towers adorned the roof, while artillery data cables on the lower floor transmitted intermittent green light packets. At 054750, the aircraft's HUD lit up with the command, Climb. As the MiG entered the final 12 kilometers of the straight approach to the target, the pilot, seeing the IP point on the HUD, leaned the stick against his chest and initiated a 45-degree climb. As the RD-33 engines engaged afterburners, the altimeter rose rapidly. 2,200, 3,800, 5,000, 100 feet. The Fowler flaps shook, the G-suit squeezed his legs mercilessly, and the edges of the visor turned into a gray tunnel. At 5,000 meters, the hammers were released. Two jolts pushed the MiG fuselage back slightly. The locked spring pressure was released in an instant, and the jet's RCS dropped by half. The rocket injection of the hammer kits roared for exactly 12 seconds, launching the bombs at Mach 0.82 followed by the composite wings unfolding like a spring and locking into a glider profile. Once the rocket fire ceased, the gliders transformed into a silent pair of steel seagulls. The GPS ions fusion system communicated with the stars like a cell phone searching for a signal, reducing the course deviation from 5 meters to 2 meters. 
It had not yet crossed the boundary line, but the hammers had already passed it. At that moment, the MiG, which had almost taken root in the sky, dove downward, its nose pointing toward the field, and descended to the 50-meter mark in a matter of seconds. The first 48 N6 missiles launched from the S-400 battery chased not the MiG, but its shadow. The MiG vanished from radar like a leech hitting the water at 40 meters. The missiles entered their automatic self-destruct program, leaving two white mushroom clouds in the sky. The Hammer Duo remained suspended in the air along the 8-kilometer terminal strip, with their dive angle fixed at 87 degrees, preparing to pierce the concrete roof like nails. The orbit computer calculated a 0.3-meter deviation due to a 12-kilometer southerly wind, adjusting the servo brakes like a muscular wrist. At the same moment, the morning briefing was beginning at the Kozinka headquarters. The drone officer projected the night reconnaissance report from the Orlan 30s onto the screen. The artillery officer verified the firing coordinates of two platoons, and the electronic warfare unit activated the long-range jamming module. As the white LED panels on the walls flashed the message, GLONASS Link Stable, the Tor M2 radar operator outside detected two small RCS glints approaching the facility's northern flank. However, the contrast was obscured by clutter, and the Air Defense Battle Management System denied fire authorization to avoid wasting missiles. When the bombs entered the terminal dive, the vertical angle was 70 degrees, and the target was 1,200 meters away. Hammer 1 activated its radar altimeter at 145 meters altitude, detected the concrete roof, and locked the delay fuse at 0.025 seconds. It pierced the roof like a can lid and embedded itself in the basement ceiling. Upon completion of the delay, 87 kilograms of PBXN-109 detonated at the speed of light. An 8,000-meter shock wave inflated and blew out the shelter walls from the inside out, engulfing the radio room, uplink server, and glonus modems in a white-hot cloud of smoke. The Hammer 2 fuel tanks arrived 0.30 seconds later, and sending the upper floor panels flying upward like a flag in a flame, the steel beams couldn't withstand 3,000 degrees, and the laboratory steel melted like caramel, bending and warping. Within half a second, the floors collapsed like dominoes, and the electrical cable of the Tor M2 radar snapped at the point where it was connected. The initial impact of the destruction was terrifying. The second was the cost. The rapid construction of the headquarters building, including reinforced concrete, converted warehouses, and reinforced roofs, cost approximately $3.3 million. The GLONASS uplink capsule on the roof, along with its backup antenna, 12-kilowatt K-band transmitter, and cryptographic equipment, cost $1.8 million. Eight Orland 30 UAV packages stored in the basement, each with an optical pod and field console, cost $450,000 each, totaling $3.6 million. Two Tor M2 air defense systems, each costing $26 million, totaling $52 million. Four BMP 2M armored personnel carriers with a modernization package, totaling $12 million. An Avtobaza M electronic warfare truck, including antenna boxes, costing $18 million. ZU-23 chassis and gas, SADCO trucks, signal generator groups, spare diesel tanks, 720mm fiber optic artillery cable, a 300-kilowatt battery bank, 812-kilowatt generators, Sarma HHF transmitters, military-grade satellite modems, 6 tons of UAV missiles, 3,000 meters of armor-piercing 30-millimeter ammunition, with a total cost of $14 million. The personnel losses amounted to 14 officers, 12 technicians, 4 drone operators, and 12 contracted soldiers. When training and deployment costs are factored in, this equates to approximately $4.1 million in personnel investment. When all the figures were added up, the value of the destroyed assets exceeded $108 million, creating a cost-effectiveness ratio of 1 to 150, compared to the total flight package cost of $720,000 
for the hammer missiles. The difficulty of the operation was of a kind that would make the dry figures hard to swallow. The MiG's flight path was within Ukraine, but the bombs required a long glide path to cross the border. The hammer's nominal range of 70 kilometers was reduced to 63 kilometers due to a 14-kilometer crosswind from the south. The pilot had to select the point where he would release the bombs 18 kilometers behind the border at an altitude of 5,100 feet. If the jet ascended slightly, it would be detected by radar. If it descended slightly, the bombs would hit the ground before reaching the building. Four parameters were safeguarded against fatal errors during planning. The climb angle must not exceed 45 degrees. The bombs must enter the glide path at less than 0.9 Mach. The rocket boost must last less than 17 seconds, and the servo brakes must reduce the CEP to below 5 meters. Each parameter was rewritten three times based on electronic warfare interference, GNSS spoofing, and wind speed. The mission was both a mathematical and a gamble. A tightrope walk. Not even a one centimeter deviation from the flawless speed altitude data on the iPad on the pilot's lap was allowed. As the explosion columns rose into the sky, Russian air defense was paralyzed by shock. The S-300 console had already switched to fast mover alert on the radar screen before the aircraft was detected. And by the time the Tor M2 operator saw the entire fireball on the thermal camera, it was already too late. The radar expert noted unknown warhead in the report. But the real unknown wasn't in the sky. It was the void left behind by millions of dollars of equipment mixed into the dust cloud. When the GLONASS uplink went silent, the artillery batteries issued a target-lost warning after an eight-second delay. The planned salvo of 64 artillery shells north of the Kherson front was canceled. Drone swarms lost their RTSP connections and as the electronic warfare truck burned, a 30 hertz jammer signal was drowned out by Baltic interference. The front line experienced this silence for the first time in five minutes. Russian field commanders heard only static crackling in response to their radio calls for coordinates. Meanwhile, the MiG-29 was completing its turn in Ukrainian airspace, throttling its RD-33 engines to 80% power and entering the Mykolaiv Tower approach at 690 kilometers. The tanks had 1,120 kilograms of fuel remaining, more than enough for a parachute landing. As the pilot raised his visor, sweat dripped down his face, soaking the padding of his helmet, and his heart rate dropped from 147 to 112. But the adrenaline rush in his ears still wouldn't subside. When the jet touched down on the runway, and deployed its brake parachute, the apron crew remained silent. There were no victory cries, because the winner of this mission was focused on the next target rather than boasting. As the parachute fabric fluttered in the wind, the dark copper-colored smoke still trailed across the sky 90 kilometers away, satellite cameras capturing it as a black spot that grew slightly larger with each pass. The Kremlin press office drafted its first statement as an ammunition fire at a border depot. But when 4K drone footage of the crater, the overturned BMP, 2Ms, and the melted GLONASS dish hit social media, the narrative unraveled. OSINT analysts measured the crater's diameter at 14 times 18 meters and its depth at 5.5 meters. The torso of a Tor M2 missile system was clearly visible, and the BMP engine blocks were identified as having oxidized to a bronze color. The internet rolled over the truth like a steamroller. The mission cost ledger was compiled in Mikolaiv. Two AASM hammer kits, $300,000 per kit, $25,000 for the MK-82 body, multiplied by two equals $650,000. MIG sortie, fuel, maintenance, engine lifespan, Pilot overtime, totaling $72,000. The financial trail of destruction, as mentioned, exceeded $108 million, with a cost-effectiveness ratio of 1 to 146. This figure was categorized under the Strategic Bargains subheading in analyst reports. 
because the accounting of war is sometimes written not in the grips of weapons, but in numbers too vast to fit into countless homes. But perhaps the most expensive item never made it into the records. The silence beneath the burning concrete of the Kozinka complex. When the GLONASS uplink went silent, artillery fire ceased, Orland swarms crashed to the ground, and electronic warfare went blind. The fuel vapor of the MiG is still hot on the runway, while the crater of the hammers has opened up a huge black hole on the war map before the smoke has even cooled. Soviet steel, French guidance, American GPS, and Ukrainian band clamp intelligence have confined the borderline to paper, and the air has once again shown who can rewrite the rules. As the next column of smoke rises from the edge of the map, who knows which concrete shell, which millions, which plans will be turned into carbon vapor deep beneath the earth. When that moment comes, don't take your eyes off the radar screen, the social media feed, or the satellite images. Because in modern warfare, border is now summed up in three simple syllables echoing after the sound of an explosion. Thank you for watching.